Uh, well, this morning, uh, we're actually going to look at three different names. Uh, they're also, they kind of overlap so much that I just decided that uh, we're going to look at three of these. Uh, one is the Amen, the other is the Faithful God, and the other one is the Faithful and the True Witness. Uh, it's interesting when you look at scripture, there is this undercurrent throughout all of scripture of this idea of the faithfulness of God. In other words, our God is faithful, which I just, just that idea alone, I think is absolutely just stunning. Uh, but look at what Hosea says in uh, Hosea 11 verse 12. He says, the Holy One who is faithful. Do you recognize that our God is Faithful. Uh, Jeremiah says this in Jeremiah 42, verse 5. Uh, it says, May Yahweh be a true and faithful witness against us if we do not act in accordance with the whole message with which Yahweh, your God, will send you to us. And there was this, there's this group talking in Jeremiah, but they says, Hey, do you recognize that, that God, Jehovah, Yahweh, is going to be a true and faithful witness? Now, I don't know what you think of when you hear the word faithful. Uh, but it was one of those words that it's like we use all the time, especially, you know, in the church. And I don't, do we actually know what it means? Does it make sense? Like, it's like one of those words we throw out all the time. And we're like, yes, amen, he's faithful. I have no idea what that means, but he is, amen, he is faithful. Uh, here's, here's just a simple way of understanding faithful or faithfulness. It's remaining loyal and steadfast. It's having constancy, fidelity, and loyalty. It's always following through on what is said. In other words, this idea of being trustworthy. So when we look at God then, so the truth that God is faithful, it means, think about this, that he is constant, that he is unchanging, that he's steadfast, he's immovable, resolute, sure, he is trustworthy, he is faithful. Now, again, this theme of God's faithfulness runs through just the entirety of scriptures. Uh, but let me just give you a few other passages. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, it says, You shall know therefore, this is Moses speaking, you shall know therefore that Yahweh, your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and his loving kindness to a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Isn't it interesting? Moses is like, can I remind you, as you're about to enter into the promised land, our God is faithful that he is God and he is the faithful one. Uh, in Deuteronomy 32, verse four, look what Moses continues by saying. He says, he is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Uh, one commentator said this about the faithfulness of God. He said, in the Old Testament, God's faithfulness and covenant love, or his hesed, are closely related. The most profound example of his faithfulness is the bond between God and the people of the northern kingdom of Israel. In spite of their unfaithfulness, God reminds them that he is betrothed to them in faithfulness, Hosea 2.20, which I just want to read to you. So get, get, the, get this context. Here is the northern kingdom who's been incredibly unfaithful, and God has sent prophet after prophet after prophet to them, asking them to repent. I mean, hey, please return to your Lord. And yet they keep just living, living unfaithful, that they're prostituting themselves with the world and the culture and, and idolatry and, and all that stuff. And so here's Hosea, and if you know Hosea's story, it's quite uh, sharp, is probably a good way of saying it, that, that God has this good Jewish man marry this non-good prostitute, why? Well, because I want to show my love to that which is unfaithful. And so in the middle of this whole scene where Hosea is having to go and buy back Gomer over and over and over again, God says, Hosea, you, you who have a genuine love for this woman, that's how I feel for my people. And yet though she is unfaithful, you are remaining faithful. And so this becomes a picture of what God is doing for the northern kingdom of Israel. So listen to Hosea 2.20. God says to Israel, I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, then you will know Yahweh. Isn't it a beautiful thought that though Israel was unfaithful, God was faithful. 
And God says, even though you've been prostituting yourself, even though you've been committing adultery with the world, do you recognize that I will remain faithful? I'm going to keep pursuing. And it is in that you will see that I am Yahweh. In other words, we will know his life and his character. Why? Through his faithfulness, even in the midst of a people who are unfaithful. I think that's beautiful. Uh, This idea of of faithfulness is is one of the key themes in the book of Psalms. And I'm not going to read them all to you because it would take the entire time. But this idea that God is faithful just runs as one of the major themes, one of the praise anthems throughout the book of Psalms. Let me just give you a few of them, though. Psalm 33, verse 4. For the word of Yahweh is upright. Think about this. And all his work is done in faithfulness. Do you realize that everything that God does is done in faithfulness? I think that's just marvelous. Psalm 36, verse 5, Your loving kindness, or your hesed, O Yahweh, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Psalm 40, verse 10, I do not conceal your righteousness within my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your salvation. I do not hide your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. Uh, Psalm 89, verse 1, I will sing of the loving kindness of Yahweh forever from generation to generation. I will make known your faithfulness with my mouth. Psalm 89, verse 8, O Yahweh, God of hosts, who is like you, O mighty Yah? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. Isn't that a beautiful thought that God's faithfulness just surrounds him? Psalm 119, verse 90, your faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Do you recognize that his faithfulness never ends? That he is always constant. He's always steadfast. He's always trustworthy. Which brings us to this idea of the amen. I really love this idea. Uh, When you look at this idea of faith in the Old Testament, The words in Hebrew, faith, faithfulness, belief, and truth are all interconnected. And they come from the same root word, which is the Hebrew word where we get our word, amen. So think about this. When we say the word amen, what what do we mean by that? Haven't you ever wondered that? We just just throw out that word all the time. Uh, For example, we're praying, right? In the name of Jesus, amen. Is like amen the sin button? You know, like you're, you're writing this email, and in the middle of this email, you know, you're like, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da, sincerely, Nathan. And then you have to hit send. So is amen like the send button to our prayers where we're praying this prayer, and it's like, in the name of Jesus. And God's sitting there, and they're going, I didn't get it. Sorry. I'm, I, I, somehow that, there was a disconnect. You, did, you didn't say amen. Like, like what is the Amen. Do you realize that when you say amen, it is a declaration of agreement. It's saying, yes, that is sure. Yes, that, that's true. Yes, hey, that is steadfast. Yes, which is why in some groups, uh, as the preacher is preaching, you'll have people who will say, amen. Meaning, meaning what? I agree with that. That's right. Amen. That's true. A- absolutely. Amen. Does that make sense? So in Hebrew, then, this idea of faith, faithfulness, belief, and truth are all, all, are all interconnected from the same root word, amen, or amen, or where we get our word amen. So faithfulness, then, conveys this idea of to strengthen, to support, or to hold up. The concept gives a sense of firmness, constancy, or trustworthiness with the notion to firmly support as the bedrock for faith. In other words, to be faithful is to be reliable so as to be dependent upon. And it's interesting, there's one time in the Old Testament where there is something physical that is called amen or faithful. And it's the doorposts or the pillars that supported the temple in 2 Kings 18 verse 16. In other words, what you see in the story of Hezekiah is that they were removing all these things. And it says that there were these these doors of the temple that were hanging on the doorposts, the pillars. And what were those pillars, those doorposts called? They were the amen. They were the faithful. Isn't that a cool thought? Uh, so as you, as you go out the doors, uh, you, you look at our little, you know, our hinges. Do you realize those things are faithful? They, they, they are steadfast. 
They are trustworthy. That they, that they open up the door, they will close the door. They open the door, they close the door. And it's a beautiful picture, actually, of the fact that it's constant. It's trustworthy. It's stable. It's faithful. Uh, so listen to a few of these verses. Isaiah 49, verse 7. Because of Yahweh, who is Amen, he's faithful. The Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Lamentations, you know this one really well, but Lamentations 3, verse 21 through 23. Jeremiah writes, this I will return to my heart. So in other words, I'm going to bring this back to my memory. I'm, going to, I'm just going to treasure this. Therefore, I will wait in hope. Well, what is his hope? The loving kindness or the hesed of Yahweh indeed never ceases. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your, amen. Great is your faithfulness. Isn't that awesome? That God's faithfulness, his mercies are great. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. It's like this hinge that is always there. He is always trustworthy. He is always unchanging. He is always steadfast. He's always immovable. He is faithful. Romans, listen to what Paul says. Romans 3, verse 3 through 4. What then? If some did not believe, believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? Far from it. I mean, you know, or in other words, by no means. What is he saying? Here's a faithful God. And even if these people do not put their belief in that faithfulness of God, does their unbelief nullify or cancel out the faithfulness of God? And Paul's like, what, would, what, are, you, what are you thinking? That's irrational. Of course God's faithfulness is going to endure. Whether you believe or don't believe, that, hey, that doesn't change his faithfulness, folks. Isn't that a beautiful thought? That his faithfulness, is, his faithfulness is not dependent on you. Praise the Lord. Isn't that good news? I love what Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.13. <clears throat> Even if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Folks, he's faithful. Well, I know, but remember that one time when I was really unfaithful? Yeah, I know that, but he remains faithful. That just as northern Israel prostituted themselves with the world and was committing idolatry and adultery, do you realize that God was still a faithful husband betrothed to Israel? His faithfulness never ends. Great is his faithfulness. So even if you are unfaithful, he's going to remain faithful. Because he can't deny his nature, his life, his character. Now listen to what 1 John 1, 9 says. If we confess our sins, think of how beautiful this passage is. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. Praise the Lord. And righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you realize that even in the midst of your sin, he remains faithful? He's trustworthy. You can return to him. His mercies are new every morning. Please contain your excitement and stay seated. But that's incredible, isn't it? Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5.24, listen to this. Faithful is he who calls you, who will also do it. Our God is faithful, folks. So let me give you two ways, and I don't think these are the only two ways, but let me just give you two ways that we can clearly see the faithfulness of our God. One way we see God's faithfulness is in his fulfilled promises. In other words, God has promised, and he cannot lie. So listen to what the writer of Hebrews says. I, this is such a phenomenal passage, Hebrews 6. And, and I would encourage you at some point to read all of Hebrews 6 because the argument is throughout the entire chapter. <clears throat> but it comes to a head here and it says, In the same way, God, desiring even more to show the heirs of the promise. Who are the heirs of the promise? Us. 
So he desires to show the heirs of the promise. Now listen to all these words about the unchanging reality of who our God is. So in the same way, God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose. He guaranteed it with an oath or a promise so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. And this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and confirmed. So the writer of Hebrews says, do you recognize that we have an anchor for our soul? It is tremendous hope. Well, what, what is it? Oh, God has given exceedingly great and precious promises. As Peter says in 2 Peter 1.4, that God has given us this overwhelming richness of promise. And the God who has promised can not lie. So ponder this. It's not that God tries not to lie. It's not that God like grits his teeth and is like, all right, I'm going to try not to lie today. He can't. It is impossible for him to lie. He is truth. There is no lie within him. It is impossible. Are you guys getting this? It is actually impossible. God can't do something. He can't deny his nature. So he can't be unfaithful. He can't be unholy. He can't lie. So if God, who cannot lie, gives a promise, do you realize that that promise is hands down guaranteed? You can take it to the bank. Well, I haven't seen the, the fulfillment of the promise. That doesn't matter. It's the fact that God has promised. And when you know God's character, that he promises and he can't lie, then you know that everything that he has promised will come to be. Guaranteed. Take it to the bank. You're obviously not getting this because you're, you're looking like you didn't get it. <clears throat> if someone can't lie and they make you a promise, uh, I come up to you and I say, I'm going to give you $100. You go, mm, I wonder. Because I can lie, folks. But if God comes up to you and says, I'm going to give you $100, even if you don't have the money in your pocket, do you recognize that it is sure? It is guaranteed. It is, it, it's a slam dunk. This is, you don't even have to question this. This is, this is absolute. This is positively going to happen. So do you realize as you come into the word, as Peter says, he's given us exceedingly great and precious promises. Which means you can take these promises to the bank. Well, I've, I've never seen anyone in human history do that. You know, the word says you can be more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus, that no sin has overtaken you, that, that I can be triumphant, that I don't have to give in to fear and lust and greed and pride. Who lives like that? I've never seen anybody do that. doesn't matter. I don't care if you've ever seen it. If God has said it and he has promised you can take it to the bank. So what if rather than doubting the word of the Lord, we would actually begin to put our faith in him? And could you imagine what would happen if we began to look at his promises as a revelation of his faithfulness, that God reveals that he is faithful? How? The fact that he has given us promises. And you begin to see that those promises always come to be. And folks, there's a lot of promises that he has fulfilled, which is only showing his trustworthiness. So as you get into some of these promises saying, hey, you don't have to be pushed around by fear anymore. You don't have to give into lust. Uh, you, you don't have to walk in pride. You do not have to live like the world around you. Even if the conclusion is, I've never seen anyone in human history do this, do you realize that you, standing upon the authority of God's word and his nature, you can go to God and say, God, I may have never seen this in human history before, but I'll be the first one because I'm taking you at your word. I'm going to believe you. You promised and you cannot lie. So Lord, I'm in the middle of a situation where I'm surrounded by all this circumstance that I would typically go into fear. But Lord, you said that I have nothing to fear. 
So, Lord, I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to actually come into alignment with the fact that I don't have to fear. Lord, I know that guys will be guys in the culture, but that doesn't have to be true in the church. And though most guys seem to be at the whim of, of their lustful whatevers, Lord, your word says I can actually have victory in that area. And though I may not even know anybody who's living like this, Lord, I'm taking you at your word and I'm going to live it. Could you imagine if we actually began to live according to the... I mean, could you imagine actually realizing that our God is faithful and because he is faithful and he has given us exceedingly great and precious promises, we have great hope. Because the life that he has called us, he has fully enabled us to live through his spirit. Please contain your excitement. But folks, that is such, a, that is such good news for me. It was probably, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. I was coming across, I was reading something. And it was one of those old promises, you know, we always put on our refrigerators. And we're like, ah, Amen. And we, we just quote it because that's, it just sounds good. And I remember reading through it, and I don't even remember which one it was now, but, but I remember reading through it, and I paused, and I was like, huh, that's true. And I knew it was true, but it finally clicked in my head that God can't lie, that that is actually true. So then why isn't it true in my life? And so I began to say, okay, God, I see it here. You promised it. You can't lie. So would you make it happen here? Because you can't lie. So Lord, I'm holding you to your own word, which is not manipulation. He promised, folks. He can't lie. So let us take him at his word. Let us be believers and believe in that which he has said. By the way, I think if we did this, it would, it would probably change everything, wouldn't it? It would probably change how you dealt with temptation. It would probably change how you dealt with your roommate. <laughs> it, it would probably change how you dealt with the financial circumstances of your life or the lack thereof, right? It, it would probably change how you handled the economy and the political stuff and, and the news cycles. And the, if I begin to realize that God has promised and he can not lie. Listen to what Paul in Romans says about Abraham. Abraham, in Romans 4.21, was fully assured that what God had promised, he was also able to do. Now, I don't know if you just think this through. This to me is mind-boggling. Because Abraham, do you realize God called Abraham? Hey, I am Yahweh. Follow me. Where are we going? Just follow Okay. And Abraham follows, comes to the promised land, and God proves himself and shows his faithfulness. And Abraham comes to the point where he's like, I'll even give you my son. You asked for it? Sure. Here's my son. Do you realize that Abraham did not have the word? He did not have 4,000 years, because it's been 4,000 years since Abraham. He did not have the last 4,000 years of God showing his faithfulness, improving himself. God just took, sorry, Abraham just took God at his word. All right, I'll trust you. Now, if Abraham could do that without the word, without the infilling of the Holy Spirit, what excuse do we have not to do it? Like, why are we not walking by faith? Why are we not living in the reality of the promises of God? If Abraham, Abraham wasn't special, folks. He's just like us. But if Abraham, who had far less than what we have access to, because we have the cross, we have the influence of the Holy Spirit, we, we have the reality of, of the, we've, we've seen God being faithful. We've seen Christian history. We've seen his word that convicts me, folks. So here's Abraham who just says, okay, God, I'll trust you. I'll give you everything. You say it, it's, it's guaranteed. It's sure. Why? Because you're faithful. 
And Abraham believed the promise. Why? Because he knew that God was able to do it. So what excuse do I have? I don't have one. Do you realize that most of us in the modern Christian world are just, we are living so paltry. We're we're living so mediocre. What if we actually believe that our God was faithful? Uh, Would you begin to take a hold of God's promises? Uh, let, Let me just give you a couple really quick here. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 25, it says, and this is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. It's a promise, folks. Or or Philippians 1, 6, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it unto the day of Christ Jesus. See, what if I begin to realize that if God begins to do something, he will always bring it to completion. What if I begin to trust him? Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says again in Hebrews 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Folks, he's trustworthy. He's unchanging. He's sure. He's steadfast. So the one who was promised is faithful. So one of the ways we can see God's faithfulness then is in his promises and the fact that what he promises always comes about. But the other way that we can see God's faithfulness, you'll never guess, it's in Jesus. Do you realize that Jesus is the faithful one? He is truth and he cannot change. When you look at John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And you start to realize that Jesus is the fullness of faithfulness. That that he doesn't change. That that he is always trustworthy. He is true, folks. I love what Hebrews 13 verse 8 says. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Meaning what? You can trust him. He's not capricious, which is a big fancy word for saying he, he doesn't just change his mind. Uh, capricious is that term that is often used. Uh, you know, like when someone's like, hey, give me a high five. Kids do this all the time, right? Give me a high five. And you're like, okay. And you, as you're coming down, they go, ha, 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 gotcha, right? That's capricious. Meaning you said something, you put it out there, and then you pulled it back. God never does that. God can't do that. He's faithful. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, Look what Acts 13 says. Uh, Acts 13, verse 32 through 33. It says, and we proclaim to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers. So there's this promise to the fathers. Well, how did God fulfill the promise? Oh, God has fulfilled this promise to our children. How? In that he raised up Jesus. Do you realize that Jesus actually is the fulfillment of all the promises? So God has promised he cannot lie. Well, how does he fulfill it? Jesus. What does he give you? Jesus. What do you need? Jesus. So when you look at Jesus, what do you see? You see the evidence of the faithfulness of our God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1.20, listen to this. For all the promises of God in Jesus are yes, and in Jesus, amen. Amen to the glory of God through us. And since you're astute Bible students, you do recognize the fun word amen is in the passage as well. So all the promises of God are in him, yes, and in him, faithful. Isn't that beautiful? And then you get into the book of Revelation and you find that God is so, I'll, I'll, I'll say it differently, You come to the book of Revelation and you find that Jesus is so faithful, that he is so true, he is so trustworthy, that the idea of faithfulness becomes his name. Look at this, Revelation 1.5. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Or Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Listen to this. His name is the Amen. 
Do you realize that one of the names of Jesus is he is called the amen? So you could say, hey, Jesus, or you could say, hey, amen. And he'd be like, yep. Because that's his name. Isn't that beautiful? What is his name? Faithful. He's the amen. And then it goes on and says, not just the amen, but he's the faithful and true witness. That's a name, folks. The beginning of the creation of God. Do you know who our precious Jesus is? He's Yahweh, the faithful one. He's Yahweh in the flesh who's demonstrating the fact that he is the amen, the, the faithful and the true witness. Or Revelation 19, 11, John says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sits on it is called, what's his name? Faithful and true. That's our Jesus, folks. Our God is faithful. So let me give you one other quick idea connected to this whole thing. And it's this idea of God's signature. Again, going back to this idea that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3.6 says it this way. For I, Yahweh, do not change. God doesn't change. He is always the same. He is constant. He's stable. He's trustworthy. He is faithful. So think about this. God doesn't change. And because he's been faithful in the past, he will continue to be faithful into the present and the future. You can always trust your God. You can always rest your weight upon him. He is a solid rock that is unshakable. He does not move. He's unchanging. He's steadfast. Or maybe you said it this way, as I said earlier, God is faithful which means he is constant, unchanging, steadfast, immovable, resolute, sure, and trustworthy. He is faithful. Now, there's this idea of God's signature. And this is, this is such a beautiful idea uh, that as you come into the book of Genesis, God looks at this man by the name of Noah and says, Noah, I want you to build an ark. And I'm, I'm going to bring judgment. And after judgment, right, uh, sorry, I'll say it this way. The rains come, the judgment comes. God saves Noah from the ark, with the ark, right? Uh, after that whole scene, God makes a promise, a covenant, and says, Noah, I, I will never do this again. I, I'm never going to flood the entire earth and bring judgment by water. And what was the sign of the promise? It was a rainbow. Now, I realize Rainbows have been hijacked in our modern culture, okay? And they no longer mean what they are supposed to mean. But I want you to see it biblically because when you actually see what a rainbow represents, it is actually, in my mind, mind-boggling. So look at Genesis 9, 13. God says, I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for the sign of the covenant or the sign of the promise between me and the earth. So God says, when you look outside and you see a rainbow, do you realize that it is a testimony? It is a sign of the fact that God has made a promise and he is faithful to keep that promise. Now, as you fast forward in the Old Testament, you come to Ezekiel. And the book of Ezekiel is a little odd because you have all these random weird creatures doing all these really weird things, right? You have chariot wheels with eyes all around it and you have these cherubim creatures with four faces. And, and it's, it's, a, it's kind of a, an odd book. But listen in, the, in Ezekiel, listen to what Ezekiel describes here in Ezekiel 128. <clears throat> he says, as the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the appearance, appearance of the radiance all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of Yahweh. And I saw this and I fell on my face and heard a sound of a voice speaking. So Ezekiel is in the middle of the scene and he's looking and he notices that there's this glory, this presence of God. And what does it look like? A rainbow. It's a declaration of character. Now, if you understand all of that and you come into the book of Revelation, you actually see what it's all pointing to. What, what, was, what was all of this all about? Why, why a rainbow? Do you realize a rainbow never changes? A rainbow is always constant. Roy G. Biv, right? 
Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, indigo. Is that how it goes? Or indigo, violet. I, I just said Roy G. Biv and I couldn't even do it. <clears throat> to write, write it down. <laughs> right, but that color scheme is always in the same order. You will never see a rainbow with colors messed up. Why? That rainbow is steadfast. That rainbow is trustworthy. That rainbow is faithful. So as you come in the book of Revelation, listen to this, Revelation 4, 3, John says, he who was sitting, speaking of God, was like a jasper stone and a sardis in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. Do you realize that in the heavenly realms, surrounding the throne of God, there is a signature, there is a picture of the very character and the nature of God. It's the fact that he's trustworthy, he's faithful, he's unchanging. So when you see a rainbow, do you realize that you should be awestruck at the reality that our God never changes? Our God is faithful. So the next time you see the rainbow in the sky, don't go, oh, beautiful, let's take a picture. You should go, whoa, I have an incredible God. I have a faithful Jesus in my life. In fact, he is so faithful, his name is the Amen, the faithful God, the faithful and the true witness. And we should stand in awe of the reality that he is trustworthy. When, when I see a rainbow, I'm constantly reminding myself, God, I can trust you, that you don't change, that you are steadfast, what if in the depths of your being, you had the cry of your heart, great is your faithfulness? Because if we began to recognize the faithfulness, the great faithfulness of our king, do you realize that it would demand that you trust him? Because you cannot say that he is faithful and then not trust him. If he's going to be faithful, if he's going to be true, if he's going to be steadfast, if he's unchanging, then why aren't we trusting so what if we begin to remind ourselves that he is faithful, that he is the amen. And every time we say amen at the end of our prayers, it should be a rehearsal and a reminder saying, God, you are worthy. You are trustworthy. You are steadfast. You are unchanging. And Lord, if I am praying according to your heart, I know that this is sure. You are faithful. So here's Lamentations again. Lamentations 3, 21 through 23. This I return to my heart. Therefore, I will wait in hope. The loving kindness of Yahweh indeed never cease. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And I just thought for kicks and giggles as a way to end. I just want to end with that old hymn, but I don't want to sing it for your sake and mine. <laughs> I just want us to ponder the words because so oftentimes we, we get into the rut of singing the songs and not think about what it means. And so this time, I don't even want to sing the song. I just want us to ponder what it means. So just as a way to, of ending, let's just declare the wonder and the reality of our precious King. L listen to this. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter, springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars and their courses above, they all join with all nature in manifold witness to your great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Pardon for sin and a peace that endures, your own dear presence to cheer and to guide, Strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow, blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. 
Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, your hand has provided. Great is your faithfulness, Lord, unto me.